Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. I was going to... was looking for Charlie. I'm Kate. Katie Alcoholic. My family calls me Kate. Um... Um, I'd rather have Charlie do more of eight and nine, although I've got plenty of experience. I just like the way he words a lot of it. Um, I will tell you one of the things that, uh, Mark Houston always said that really rocked my world was in the eighth step or in the ninth step, it said, uh, made a list of all persons we had harmed, excuse me, in the eighth. The word all is a very powerful word, and that means i got to go back to all, and one of the things that you'll hear in most meetings is uh, a term called living amends, and that, that to me, you know, in the 12th step it says practice these principles in all our affairs. That to me is what a living amends would look like if we have to use that term, is that I am just acting like a sober member of, of, of the world today. There is no such thing as a living amends. Chris puts it also another way. is, is If you stole somebody's TV, they don't care that you're not stealing TVs anymore. They want their TV back, right? And, uh, and the truth of the matter is, is that Mark used to say, how free do you want to be? And if you, if you are resistant on making these amends, the truth of the matter is, 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 uh, what do you know, what do you know that you don't know? How do you know what you don't know? And, and, um, you have to go back and, and trust the process. I really wish my husband was here. I was going to jump into 10. Um, can I jump to 10 and have Charlie come do eight and nine? Yeah. It, he, he just words it better than I do. I just get all bobbly, but the truth is I made 35 year old amends a couple of weeks ago, to an old boyfriend that I'd basically left at the altar. And uh, it was the most moving experience I have ever had in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I always knew in my heart I needed to make this amends to this guy. I mean, I basically, after after being with him for three years, just, just walked away, told him I needed a little break, and then left town. Yeah. You know, and most people would say, oh, you know, it's been so long, you don't have to go back there and do that. And, uh, oh, I knew, I knew deep, you know, you know that feeling, deep. I needed to go clean that up. Um, I'm not called him. He said, yeah, it's Kate Australia. He goes, no shit. <laughs> and uh, when I met with him, he, uh, uh, we, had, we, had, we, had, we had lots of tears, lots of tears. And it was, it was moving. And it was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. I would have missed that had I not ever met Mark Houston. You know that? Yeah. If I never had somebody really talk to me like that and really wake me up, I would have missed that. There's so many, so many things in this book that we, we've missed. So I'm just going to jump to 10 and Charlie's going to come back and, 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 and Chris do, do theirs. I, I love the 10 step guys. I believe it's, I believe a lot of, a lot of misconceptions in the 10 step. I believe the 12 and 12, which I think is a good piece of literature, has a tendency to stand in the way of the great. You know, oh God, you, you you take you take a beating for that statement. What are you saying? The twelve and twelve is not okay. No, I think the twelve and twelve is good. It just has a tendency to stand in the way of the great, and the great is the big book. And um, so, the reason why is because uh, for me, there's lots of really good things. It's it's an essay. It tells us don't you know that, that our basic text is the most important. But one of the things is in the tenth step. In the 12 and 12, it talks about an evening review. And what he's doing is he's dissecting the different types of inventories when he's talking about them in the 12 and 12 in the 10th step. I mean, in the uh, 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 in the 12 and 12, they're talking about the different types of inventories that are taken, the 4th step, the 10th step, and the 11th step, right? Those are all inventory steps. Are we all in agreement on that? And so... A lot of people have a tendency to believe that the 10th step is the evening review, which is clearly the 11th step in the big book. Now, some people go, well, I mean, 10th step, 11th step, whatever. 
oh my God, what's going to happen to our 12-step program if we go, oh, whatever, oh, well, you know what we meant by that. No, the 10th step is a spot check inventory to be taken in, in the midst of, yes? And so here's the deal. Behind the 10th step, it's on page 84, right? Once again, continue, continue, continue. It says this thought brings us to the 10 steps, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. And it also tells us before that that we don't stop doing the ninth step, right? We're going to continue. The ninth step is going to go on forever. I mean, I, I've met very few people who have actually completed their ninth step. You know, I, more stuff just keeps bubbling up. So I, I, at this point, have not completed my ninth step. And uh, it says, uh, we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. There's our line. We entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Growing in understanding and effectiveness, man, I ask for that every day in prayer and meditation because I'm telling you what, guys, I can become, Charlie said, I'm as subtle as a punch in the mouth. I mean, I, I, I am, he said, sometimes talking to me too is like time to take a drink out of a fire hose. You know, I, I just come out and just, you know, that is not always growing in understanding and effectiveness. I am sure I've already pissed off some of y'all in here. You know, it's like, Oh, come on, try. And I ask for that in my prayer and meditation. There's a lot of verbiage in 10 that I really do take to heart. And uh, it says here it's not an overnight matter. You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this. But it tells me i got to watch for four things. And you got your book sitting right in front of you. It says to watch, not wait, which means they're going to be coming. Right? There's a big difference between waiting and watching. Because these things are going to come because that's in my DNA. It's selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And, and here's the thing that cracks me up with my sponsees. I tell them all the time. I don't hear from them for, oh, a week. Or when they call, they go, I, I'm just checking in. Huh. So you're checking in, and I'm calling my sponsor going, man, I am freaking out over here. So, or I am pissed. How do I get in touch with this stuff? And these sponsees, are just, I'm just checking in been 14 days. I said, so you haven't had any selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, or fear crop up? What are you doing? Who are you talking to about these things? Because there's four things you got to do, right? First one is what? Ask, what? Watch this, but ask God to remove it. Second, talk to somebody immediately. Talk to somebody immediately. Make an amends if we have stepped on anyone's toes, which usually happens if we haven't, happens if we haven't talked to somebody immediately, yeah? Well, stepping on toes right and left. And then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help, which basically is just getting me re-God-centered. It's getting me off of self-centeredness and re-God-centered. And it does take all four of those things to have that happen because otherwise, this is how I know when I've got to call my sponsor, is if I'm 20 minutes in my head still thinking about it. I better, I better pick that phone up. I'm not doing very well. Sometimes I can just ask God right away, especially if it's a fear. I can ask God to remove it immediately. That's how I can always tell when I'm spiritually fit is when my default setting is prayer. When I go right to prayer, when I go to thinking and thinking and thinking, and then before you know it, man, I am driving, and I got a whole shit storm of cussing going on up there. How many of y'all know that one? Where, yeah, you're driving along, you're like, oh, gosh, I can't hear this <laughs> You know, and before you know it, man, I'm into dialogue. And the dialogue is having a life of its own. I said this, and they said this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And I better be picking the phone up pretty quick, man. Because that, I'm, I can't tell you how badly that spins out. And if you believe the first step, oh, man, I'll get so blocked. I'll get so knotted up. And then if I don't do an evening review to verify that I did, in fact, do the 10th step, I'll wake up the next morning with what? An emotional hangover. Just like the 12 and 12 says. I'll have an emotional hangover, and I'll go through the day like this. People are like, how, how are you doing? And then in about three days, I really can't even remember what it was. But before you know it, I got the whole thing. It's just a, you know, and then I'm just walking along just kind of shooting everybody. Everybody's talking. My sponsor always likes to take me back to the line. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. She likes this part. From its stems, 
all forms of spiritual disease. So you're talking about a vein that runs through me. And, and this resentment, all of a sudden, I'm getting restless. I'm getting irritable. I'm getting discontent. I'm sick. You know, I, I call uh, business on the line. Now, I'm, I'm mad at, say I'm mad at Charlie, which happens frequently. I know that's really hard to believe that you'd be upset with your significant other, right? But we're having, <laughs> you know, we're, we, we had just one little, you know how quickly it gets out of hand, you have a quick little flare-up? You know, we're just tuning along, everything's fine. Just, wow, wow. It's like a heel gave out on you, you know, and you're down. And all of a sudden, I'm, I am walking around, and I am mad, I am mad, I am mad. And then, you know, I haven't called my sponsor, whatever happens, and then a day or two goes by, and I don't really have the resolution I'd like for us to have in this disagreement. And then I call some business, and the woman on the other end of the line is a little short with me. I mean, y'all know that one. I'm like, well, if you'd if you'd listen to what I'm saying, nah. you know. And then I become a crazy gal on that phone, and she is getting everything based on what's going on with Charlie and I. See, that's what I'm talking about. We can't afford that. We alcoholics, we cannot afford this. Um, then, you know, so, so we've got the four things that we are watching for, very crucial. And then we've got the four things we are to do. And I'm telling you what, my sponsees, when they call me, I go, there is no checking in, guys. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of checking in. Now I'm talking about the new guy. You got some time, you know. I, I mean, if we haven't touched base in, a, in, in four or five days, I'm all good with that. But I'm not. The guy that's got a couple of years, there's, there's no checking in. You're, you're so running on self-will. You just, you just want to not feel guilty and, and stay in touch. You know what I mean? When people say, when would you call your sponsor last? Oh, huh, yesterday. You know, and I'm just like, I'd like to have a video camera following you around. See how well you're doing out there. And uh, uh, <laughs> Charlie and I have talked about that a lot. So then we go here and we talk about uh, love and tolerance uh, of others is our code. Now, I, I tell you what, th that term is used way too freely in AA. You know, like say, say if I'm standing there and I'm really angry and somebody goes, love and tolerance is like, oh, oh I want to take you out. You know, <laughs> you, don't, don't be lobbing that out when I'm struggling here. You know, you could lob out something like, uh, wow, okay, it sounds like you're pretty resentful. Yeah, I am, aren't I? You know, something like that, but the love and tolerance is our code. <laughs> you know, like we're some Pollyanna crowd here. You know, I mean... That's the kind of stuff that makes me crazy. That is a promise. Love and tolerance is not in my DNA, man. I'm not that gal. I mean, I, I've got to work very hard at these steps to have an entire psychic change to have love and tolerance. I'm all about blaming, right? I am, okay, you got to nod some more, guys. Y'all are looking at me like, man, hey. Bitch is crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I mean, I am in the right room, right? I mean, I didn't step into the PTA, did I? And I went. But see, that's that's what goes on in this head, man. I mean, I, I I'm not kidding you. I got some crazy stuff up there, and that's so. When I look at stuff and I go, love and tolerance, that's got to be a promise. You know, because that's just not who I am. It says, and we've ceased fighting everything or any, anything or anyone. Mark loved that term. You know, so if I'm fighting you, or if I'm, I love uh, that um, Chris said earlier, judgment. Man, I'm a, I'm judgmental. Wow. I mean, it, it's almost like it's somebody else's voice goes, who do they think they are? Where did that come from? You know, and I, then I think, I mean, I agree with you, but then the whole conversations going on up there you know what I mean and uh wow so uh then you know we come on up to 85 and and uh uh when it when it talks about that position of neutrality safe and protected I tell my sponsees this all the time like they'll call me and go oh my god you know I mean I I don't know you know this job situation I'm all freaked out if I should do this or I should do that or or you know what should I do and I go ho 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 you're doing the work man you are knee-deep involved in this process. You are in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Is there anything you can do about that right now? No. Have you done everything you can possibly do? Absolutely. 
when you're in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, go call a drum, go work with the drum, and get out of yourself. Stop that chatter. That's just driven by fear, man. And that baby will take you down a hundred roads, and you'll feel every feeling as if it were happening. Don't go there. Don't go there. Thank God she called me. That's what we're talking about. Don't go there, man. Let me walk you off the ledge. How many of y'all know that feeling when you're on the ledge? And yeah, once again, I can't hear God. I need a drunk, man. Somebody talk to me. Somebody talk to me. And you back them off that ledge just far enough to where you go, okay, okay, I got it now. That's that position of neutrality, safe and protected. And then you go carry the message. Because there's no more you can do right now. Okay, that's all I wanted to say on 10. That's it. I guess I was out in the parking lot for the start of this one. I apologize. I was returning a message from my daughter that had her grandson over with bubbles in the hot tub. She oh, was, yeah, yeah, she was uh, concerned about the cloudiness of the water and didn't want to. <laughs> she didn't. She didn't want to dunk our grandson in there. We had, we just fired our pothead pool boy out the last week. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure you don't have pothead pool boys in Canada, do you? Um, but I, that our daughter was afraid she was going to put our grandson in there and just pull out the bones, you know. I, uh, so uh, I was having to talk her down, talk her down. I, uh, last job on 10, I guess, am I doing 8 and 9? 8 and 9, eight, some 11. Okay, well, um, you know, we just finished doing 6 and 7. And I was talking with the guy during the break, you know, about the pace of working these steps. And I'm just, I just have to keep going back to trying to do this as rapidly as I can. Because, you know, when we're working with this guy, i got to keep pushing him through the work because I really believe that if I don't, I'm going to eventually relapse. You know, if I don't get in touch with this power and remove what's blocking me from this power, I'm going to be real. You know, and we I had a great talk with the guy during the break. And is Ian still here? Ian? No, the other one. McPherson, is that you? Did you write these two questions on the... He wanted to know what Katie meant when she said it, cows and cabbage. She said, well, that's an old Texas, but, you know, when you tell somebody off, you know, it's like, you know, we really told them how the cow ate the cabbage. That's, uh, that's, uh, it's just an old expression for, you know, letting somebody know what, what the real deal is, you know, and kind of tell them off. And then stuck like Chuck um, is another one that he was a little curious. I don't know who Chuck is, but, uh, um <laughs> It just means uh, SOL or, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. How did the cow eat the, whose cabbage did that cow eat anyway? Um, sometimes we forget about some of these little Texas colloquialisms. Uh, I uh, had a friend that moved from California, and he would just he would just write down the stuff we'd say in meetings because he just thought we were hilarious, you know. And I mean, any time somebody would come off with some big Texas thing, he'd write it down and and one, it was a friend of ours, Richard from Texas, that, that uh, he was in that book, Eat, Pray, Love, and he was in our home group and stuff. And, and uh, But he fished a lot, and he had this little spot that we called his honey hole. They had this one little spot that he would catch a lot of fish in. And, you know, and a big bass is called a hog. You know, anybody heard that expression? You know, like if you catch a big, large mouth bass, we call it a hog. Well, Tom, the guy that's always writing down our little Texas expressions, we're all standing around one day after the meeting, and, and <laughs> Jeff, who went to La Hacienda, you know, Jeff, um, he goes, I heard Richard jerked a hog out of his honey hole the other day. <laughs> and Tom goes, What? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we did the seven step prayer and it says now we need more action right this is a program of action now we need more action without which we find that faith without works is dead you know why there's quotation marks around that thing it's because it's a direct quotation from the book of james out of the bible you know so i'm not a big bible guy but you know we're quoting outside literature here in the big book again. You know, I, uh, um, anyway, that's a whole other topic I'm not going to go down. But it's, that's why those quotation marks are there. And it says, let's look at steps eight and nine. Now, Katie addressed this earlier. And we went to a big book study one time, and I thought, hot dog. we got a couple of real authorities here. 
and it was Mark Houston and Dave F. And I thought, well, we're going to run up, and we're going to, I'm going to be able to, because I had a couple of questions that were really bothering me. And at the, on page 70 and on page 76 are two different places where it says, we have a list of all persons we've harmed. You know, and at the end of the fourth step, it says, we have a list of the people we've harmed through our conduct, and we're ready to make amends to them. And I'm like, well, I don't really have that list from the fourth step inventory. And then here again on 76, it says, we have a list of all persons we have harmed. We made it when we took inventory. It troubled me a great deal because I'm not good at just blowing off lines here and there out of the big book, I think. And so I go to these guys and I go, but I wind up going to Dave and I go, oh, why does it say we have a list of all persons we have harmed? And he goes, well, you know, I just, you know, and he kind of blew me off. And then, uh, and he says, uh, oh, that's when he goes, you're trying to pick the black out of the pepper. And I go, so I know how you feel when you said the cow ate the cabbage. I'm like going, I'm going, okay, okay. So I go back and I sit down. And then the next meeting he goes, you know, but he says, but I'm anal. He goes, I, I got to have answers for all this. It's all going to make perfect sense to me when the next break. You know, here I come again. You know, and I go, okay, how come you get to be anal, but I'm trying to pick the black out of the pepper, you know, and we, and we still didn't really get an answer. And then. And then a little while later, I didn't get a straight answer, and I go, I go up to him again at the next break, and I go, okay, let's do it like this. You're sponsoring me. And he goes, okay. And I go, when do I make my amends list? And I still didn't get a straight answer. But, I mean, this thing has been troubling me for a long time, and I went to Mark. How many of you guys ever met Mark or listened to him talk? I love this guy, you know, and... uh I go to Mark, and he, he didn't want to hear a bunch of BS about it. He just goes, if you work with me, the fourth step and the eighth step are going to be two separate events. And I was like, okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget the first time we met Mark. We were at this big book weekend, and this, this guy comes up, and he, this cute little guy that was there in the deal, and I mean, Mark picked on him the whole weekend, and he calls this guy up front, and he says, uh, Brian, do you meditate? And the guy goes up. Uh, well, I'm a truck driver, and uh, it says sometimes I'll meditate when I'm driving the truck. You know, when I'm in the cab of the truck and I'm driving, I, you know, I'll, I'll, med I'll meditate, you know, stuff like that. And, and Mark goes, okay, Brian, um, two things. In the future, when I ask you a yes or no question, I'm going to expect a yes or no response. Second of all, and he goes, and now... <laughs> I'm going to ask you whether or not you meditate, and it's important for me for you to say no. You know, <laughs> we're like going, whoa. Oh, no, I, I skipped that part. He goes, he goes, first of all, when you're driving the truck, we want you to be about driving the truck. You know, he goes, we don't want you meditating when you're behind the wheel of a tractor trailer. And then he goes, so I'm going to ask you again if you meditate, and I need for you to say no. And Katie and I were just like, oh, I'm so glad he didn't call me up there, you know, because... I did more meditation that weekend than I'd done in, in the previous years of, of hanging out, you know. So, I mean, I know what it's like to, to not be really up to my ears in this stuff. Eight and nine, we hear a lot, when we're talking about removing manifestations of self and that sort of thing, if that's the drive of the work, if it's the root of my problem, which I'm starting to see more and more in this book, we talk a lot about, you know, you, we lose people in the fourth step, you know, and we lose people, you know, when you get to the inventory process. I don't, that hadn't been my experience. I, we, if I don't have a driving step one experience, you're going to lose me in the eighth step. You're going to lose me in the ninth step. You know, fourth step, we're still talking about my favorite topic in the fourth step, right? We're talking about me. I mean, you know, I may not want to talk about it, but this is all stuff I did, you know, it's my resentments, my fears my sex life, you know, that sort of thing. But when we get up to eight, and you're telling me that I finally got a little crinkle in my pocket for the first time in years, and you're going to tell me it's not mine, and i got to give it to somebody else, i got to make, I mean, I, Jamie is one of my favorite sponsees, and I've talked about Jamie from 100 podiums. He's this guy that came up to me one time. I could see him coming at me from 50 feet away. He was one of these pigeon-toed and wearing these shorts. He's got a ring in his nose and dreadlocks out to here, and ink everywhere you can see and, and uh what's up dude you know and um and from 50 feet away i'm just like please god <laughs> don't ask me to sponsor you you know and uh and he you know here it comes you know and he's like and i love this guy he's one of my best guys he's one of my best soldiers and i've got so many jamie stories when you see a guy like that hopeless 
alcoholic dope fan, hope to die, you know, and have a step one experience. This guy is on fire and has been for four years. And I mean, one of my most recent memories, he came into my office and he was mad at his wife. He was mad at his wife. And by God, this time it is her fault. It is not my fault. It is her fault. And he goes, and I am not making amends to her. Unless you tell me to, and then I will. But um, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's my boy there. You know, I mean. <laughs> but what got me started talking about drugs? Eight, eight. Well, I mean, it's just you know, he he went ahead. Uh, well, Jane, I got so many amen stories, baby. One one immense story is I watched this guy go from being this hopeless drunk in the pro, you know, in detox where I met him to eventually you know flying up to Mount Olive, New Jersey from Texas to make amends for a nineteen year old um warrant for his arrest, you know, to the to the county of Mount Olive. And he knew he could go to jail in that process and he sat there at our kitchen table on Thursday night and said the only reason they'll put me in jail is if there's somebody in that jail Is there somebody in that jail that I'm the only one that can get the message to? That's not the power, Jamie. It's not the power of Charlie Parker. It's the power of God working through these steps in somebody's life. And uh, if you've never gotten to be a piece of some of that, you're missing the real juice of this program. I mean, you talk about setting your ass on fire. I mean, that's when this deal gets really, really cool. So what I was just talking about, though, that I'm going to bail on the... Oh, I know what got me talking about, Jamie. Yes! Oh! <laughs> One day he calls me up. He's a musician. You know, if you couldn't tell from the dreadlocks and the ink. And, 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 uh, and, uh, he's, and he goes, I've been down looking at this new bass guitar, you know, and uh, you know, it's really... And I go... Jamie, well, that, that, did you ever make amends to that studio you stole all that equipment from? And he already he knows where this is going. And he goes, no, no, I didn't. I go, that money you got in your pocket, whose is it? And he goes, well, I guess it's there. And I go, you want to steal from them twice? And he's like, okay. You know, so he didn't buy the bass guitar. He starts paying these guys back. That kind of willingness only comes from a rock-solid step one experience. That's a guy that believes if he doesn't do this stuff, he's eventually going to get so uncomfortable that the mental obsession returns, and he'll drink again. So that's when I talk about step one driving everything. That's what powers me through this amends process. Mark sat down at our table you know, on a Thursday you know, night, and, the, and I thought it was so intuitive you know, that he goes, I just get the feeling we should address the eighth step here. You know, where are you guys with your amends process? And you know, we had guys with time, you know, 19 years, to, you know, 20 years, and eight years, 13 years. And so. Well, everybody had a ton of unfinished amends, you know. And it turns out it wasn't all that intuitive. He knew it was coming. I mean, because all of us, when you take me in and you say, "Where you know, I want to go, I want to go back through the work," you know. And Katie talked on there. I always want to do another inventory, right? Because we're talking about my favorite stuff again, huh? But when you go, what about the amends from your last inventory? Do you have any unfinished amends? And we did an exercise at my Thursday night. We just, where all the guys at the table, we all got spiritual consent with each other. We're all, you know, have given each other position to call each other on our stuff. We all went home and we made out an eighth step list. And when we came back a week later, and we everybody read their eight step list out loud to the group. And man, you talk about a powerful uh, experience. Because I can tell you, if you've got a crew of people that you you feel like you've got that kind of spiritual relationship with, it's a powerful experience because you better keep your pen handy. Because while I'm sitting there, you know, and this, say Chris is reading off his amends list, you go, oh, oh, I didn't forget about that one. You know, I mean, it was a little bit big. I mean, it was stuff all the way from, you know, the guy goes, well, I ate in a lot of restaurants and I walked out without paying them. You're like, oh, damn. <laughs> you know, and then the next guy goes, I, I bought gas and drove out of the station and didn't pay. And I, 
Mm, wow, okay, you know, and I wrote that, you know, and I mean, just a little to big, all kind of stuff, you know, and I, you know, I robbed my parents of, of the uh, the experience they could have had in having a son, you know, and, and took away their dreams and their ambitions and that sort of thing. Uh, okay, I, I got, you know, I guess I'm, I kind of made a little feeble amends to my mother, you know, and, you know, and, but it was a powerful, powerful experience, and, and, and you know, there is such an experience available in the amends process that most of us have never tapped into because what happens with most of us is we make that list and I make the big ones like Katie was talking about. I make the, the, the people that are first touched by that tornado that's roaring its way through people's lives, the first people that get touched by it, I'll make amends to them because I'm probably going to run into them, you know, my mother, my dad, my sister, my girlfriend, you know, those just the one or the ones that are eating my life. But then what happens? That list has a way of finding its way down into a drawer, and then I just start going to meetings, and and I, you know, and maybe I'm sponsoring somebody. But what I started seeing, I tend to transmit my own experience. If my experience in the amends process is weak, my sponsorship in the amends process is going to be weak. Does that make sense? And the other thing that you'll see in the fellowship, the bulk of the advice that you're going to get in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous about the amends process is geared towards not having to make the amends. Did you hear what I said? Most of the advice you're going to get out there is going to be geared towards not having to make the amends. Why? Because they haven't finished their amends process. Nobody wants to be a phony bastard in AA. I don't want to sit there and tell you, you've got to make all of those amends. You know, and let me know how that works. I might try it on myself. You know, I, you know <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's unbelievable. I had a sponsee in the, in the Sunday morning meeting one time, and I said, watch this. Watch this, Ed. We're going to have a meeting this morning on the amends process, and I'm going to try to get them to talk about direct experience with making the amends. And you watch people dodge the topic. I mean, you watch people, they're going to talk about more crap than you've ever heard. And after the meeting, he goes, I wouldn't have believed it if you hadn't warned me it was coming. It was, it was unbelievable. At one point, I was going, does anybody have any experience with making direct amends? You know what I mean? Because it was like, it was hard to get anything out of anybody. One girl, I swear to God, goes, here's another one that sets me Sends me to the moon. Living amends. The only place that implies living amends in here is it says in the family we may it may have a long period of reconstruction ahead. Most of the time, what we hear people describing as living amends is nothing more than practicing these principles in all our affairs, right? This girl goes. I used to work for this company, and uh, I uh, I was embezzling money from them. But uh, I'm, I'm making living amends to them now because I'm working in another company and I'm not stealing from them. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, I'm sure that's very comforting to the people that you stole you know, the money from, you know. Can, can you imagine, Chris, I stole uh, $500 out of your wallet, you know, yesterday, but uh, I'm not stealing today. Does that make you feel any better? You know, uh, you know, the... Chris has said it from a hundred podiums. The lady whose TV I stole doesn't give a flip that I'm not stealing TVs anymore. She wants her stinking TV back. You know, we're talking about making direct amends for all, and there's two really tough words in the, in the eighth step, and it says it twice, all and all. Made a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Oh, God, is that tough, you know, because... That's why I say, I mean, I don't know how y'all ran, but the way I ran out there, I don't know that I'll, I don't think I'll ever stand at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous and say I have made all of my amends. You know, I think, I hope to one day get to the point where I can say I've made all the amends for harms that I'm aware of. But Katie and I were walking along in Crested Butte, Colorado one time, and she thought I had a stomach cramp because we were in this amends process. The other thing I can tell you is when you get in the spirit, the spirit of the amends process, stuff is going to start bubbling to the surface. Stuff that I've been kind of, Punching down, you know, holding like a turd in a punch bowl, you know, trying to, trying to hold, hold it down, you know, for us. That's, uh, well, yeah, you went. Do you need any explanation on that? Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> But stuff starts... Stuff. People say that back and back, what, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
stuff starts popping to the surface. And we're walking along one day, and I go, oh, oh, Jesus. And she goes, what, what? And I go, oh, just one time I was riding my dirt bike by this Mesquite golf course, and uh, um, I just rode out on the golf course, and I did a donut on the green right around the flag and popped a wheelie and rode off, you know. And guys were running at me, shaking their seven irons at me and stuff, you know. And I'm like, nah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I had had that punch now forever. I called that guy up. I'll never forget it. I'm in the golf business, you know. I mean, I called this guy up, and I go, hey, listen, uh, I need to talk to you about something. I said, uh, one day I was riding my dirt bike past your golf course, and I rode out on the, on the green, and I did a donut around the flag, and I, I'm really sorry, and I'd like, to, I'd like to know how I could make that right. And he goes, uh, when was that? And I said, best of my knowledge, 1972. <laughs> and he goes, I'm pretty sure that grass is growing back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I'm really sorry, and I, you know, and and I appreciate you, you know. And, and if there's anything I can do to make it right, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to. Do it. But I mean, and and when we're in this process, you know, when we talk about making a list, one of the things that that we do in our lineage is we make amends cards, and we get out a little stack of three by five cards because for some reason the stack of cards it's not out of the big book. You can use it, or do it or not do it. But when it says made a list, once I've made my list of people that I've harmed. I like to go back and get out a little set of three by five index cards and write who the person is or what the institution was, what the harm was, you know, their contact information, what the harm was, and then down at the bottom I put two other things. Have I harmed you in any other way? What can I do to make this right? Because what happens is part of living a life based completely on self and self-centeredness is I have very little awareness of my effect on other people. You know, when I'm based, when, I, when I'm thinking about my motives and my stuff, you ever just been going along and you look up and somebody's hurt and you're like going, what? You know, I wasn't trying to do that. You know, and I might go to my sister and go, uh, Carol, I'm, I stole $15 out of your purse one time and I feel really terrible about that. And, and, you know, and then can you imagine her going, that's the way you think you've harmed me? That's not even in the top ten of the things that you did to hurt me, you know. And I mean, so then I got to be ready to sit down and listen to that. Have I harmed you in any other way? Because there's a very good chance that there's stuff that I did. I called a friend of mine to make amends the other day. I saw a friend of mine on the television. He's a professional comedian, and I and I, I knew that there was some bad blood between us. And I I had been trying to think, of, and I called him up the next day. This is just last week, and we spent an hour on the telephone. Where I said, man, I just, I really have the feeling that I have hurt your feelings in some way. I feel an energy between us, and I, and I don't know what it is. And I mean, we talked for an hour, and it wasn't even anywhere close to what I thought I'd done to harm this guy. And it was, it was some pretty significant stuff, and it stemmed from that marriage that we were talking about, and. And so that thing where he started thinking, he goes, you know, I started, I was sure watching the way you were behaving. I started thinking maybe you weren't the guy I thought you were because I used to look up at you as a spiritual mentor. And then I saw you doing, you know, exhibiting some dishonesty in your life and doing stuff that seemed to be outside the values that I thought you had. And, you know, it's a tough conversation, you know. And uh, but I mean, that wasn't what I thought he was pissed about. You know, what it, it would have never occurred to me. So. Keep that question in mind about have I harmed you in any other way. And I love the immense cards. I got a stack of immense cards sitting right next to my desk mat at my office right now. And I'll pick them out and I'll flip through them. And it's so funny. This daughter that we talked about, uh, I took her to lunch one day for Vietnamese food. And while we're talking, we're going along having a good time. And I pull out this little card. And I, and I started talking to her about, you know, because, you know, I knew her dad before he died. I, I've known her uncle since she was five years old, and we're talking, and uh, I make a real good amends to her, and we talk about a lot of stuff. And then she goes home to her husband. We love her husband. And uh, he goes, he, he made amends to me today at lunch. You know, he started talking to me about all that stuff. And then she goes, he had a card. And, and then I was like, what? And she goes, He's got one with your name on it. And, 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 you know, and I started noticing after that, every time I'd see him, Dad would be like, hey, how you doing? Everything, you know, everything's fine between us, right? You know, the, please don't pull that card out on me. You know, I mean, because, because, 
Because sometimes they're as uncomfortable hearing it as I am saying it, you know. I mean, and there are some times when you have to go. And sometimes the temptation is, one of the things I've noticed in making amends a lot of times is there's a real, uh, sometimes there's a, an initial reaction, or an initial tendency to try to go, oh, no, that's, a, that's nothing. You know, Katie just made amends to a boyfriend that she heard 35 years ago. And when she first started talking to him, the guy's like, ah, oh, come on. She goes, no, I really need to sit down and talk to you. And the guy wound up crying four times during the amends, you know. So this was the same guy that had been saying, it's nothing, don't worry about it. Sometimes you've got to press through, you know, and go, this is important. It's important, you know, because I know it's there. And, I, and it, you know, it would mean a lot to me if you'd allow me to clean this up. And, you know, it was a powerful experience between her and this guy. You know, it came as a result of her getting to give an AA talk in her hometown, and she got to make uh, several amends that weekend. It was part of Katie's story. Y'all were here Friday, a lot of you, right? Well, you know how she talked about cheating in high school? She's always told this story about, you know, breaking into this teacher's briefcase and stealing the answers to the essay questions, and it's always been a funny part of her story and everything. And I get a call one day, they go, would you like to come speak at the mouth of the Brazos Conference? I said, where is that? He said, it's in Lake Jackson, Texas. And I said, oh, you don't want me. You want my wife. Um, my wife went to high school in Lake Jackson. And so uh, Katie winds up giving the talk, and she said that was very nice of me to give it to her. She goes, I don't think I would have reciprocated. I don't think I would have done that if they'd asked me to come to your hometown. <laughs> so when we're talking about self-centeredness, it still lives, you know. But she's getting ready to talk, and I look over, and she is. She goes, Miss Shaw is in the audience with 26 years of sobriety. And I go, who's Miss Shaw? She goes, the English teacher with the briefcase. <laughs> And so she was freaked out, you know, and she goes over to her and goes, are you Miss Shaw? And she goes, yes, I am. She goes, are you al or A? And she goes, I'm 26 years sober and out in AA. Well, so now Katie has to leave that whole piece out of the story. It had never occurred to her that there was an amends that needed to be made there, you know? And she wound up going to the lady after the meeting, and the lady wound up taking her face in her hands and going, you are forgiven, my child. I used to cheat in high school myself. And, you know, so, <laughs> but, I mean, it's the thing about when I say, I don't know that I'll ever get to a point where I go, well, I've made all of my amends because stuff pops to the surface, you know. Um, anyway, there are more instructions. How much time do we have? Okay. <laughs> I just want to tell you, there are more instructions on the amends process in the big book than there are in any other step. If you look for clear-cut directions, they're in there. If you're flipping through those pages from 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, all the way up to um, the ninth step promises that start on page 83, there are directions about a lot of situations in our life. You know, what is our real purpose? When the, how do we address the man we we hate? What what about their part? Money on the middle of page seventy eight. Criminal offenses at the bottom of seventy eight. A prayer for willingness here, where it says reminding ourselves that we've get, decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing. Little clue: there's a lot of prayers in the big book. Whenever it says we ask, it's usually a prayer. And if it says we ask him or we ask God, it's always a prayer. So it's worth doing those prayers when you come across them. It goes on to talk about what if we go too far? What if it affects others? What about domestic troubles? What to tell? Longer amends about the stuff about the family. Uh, um, the cyclone. And then there's talks about dealing with the family and meditation. So, so we clean, asking each morning in meditation that our Creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. There's another ninth step prayer. And it goes on to talk about the spiritual life is not a theory. And it talks about how we talk about it to the family, longer amends, amends that we can't make right now. I use this a lot of times for people that have died or people that we can't get in touch with. It says there may, may be some people that we can't reach. To them, we send an honest letter. One of my sponsees wrote a letter to his mother and flew out to California and read it by her graveside. 
He made several other man's lies out there. But, you know, there's some there's stuff in here that we can do. If we, if we feel like somebody's not around, we can still make that amends. These nine step promises are powerful. When Kay talked about step 10, a nice job on that, I've got about three. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. Mark H. changed our whole life on prayer and meditation. I don't think we're the only ones in Alcoholics Anonymous that weren't real actively involved in steps 10 and 11. You know, that's why I tell these sponsors and what Katie was talking about, where I go, God, I must be a hell of a sponsor, you know, because obviously none of you guys have experienced selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, or fear in the past week, because I haven't had a 10th step call from one of you in the past week. Are you, or, or are you talking to somebody else about it? And they'll go, I oh, know I'm not talking to anybody else about it. You know, so what's the deal? You know, do you, is it possible? We had a guy that would come in every week at the Thursday night meeting and he'd go, I haven't done any evening reviews or any morning meditations and I really need to do that. I'm really going to make a point of doing it this week. And they'd come back in the next Thursday and go, I haven't really done any more of those, you know, but I really need and so And finally we had to offer him a consideration where we go, is it possible that the reason you're not doing any prayer and meditation is because you don't think it's important and you think you can stay sober without it? Do you believe, because if I'm going to judge your beliefs by what your actions say, your actions say you don't think this stuff's important and you think you can stay sober without it. Maybe you've developed a level of control over this disease that we don't possess, you know? It, do my actions show that I'm a person that's convinced that his life on well self-will can hardly be a success? We start rolling into this deal and doing step 11. Holy mackerel. You talk about something that changes your day. I mean, we, you know, and I love Bob Darrell. Is a, Bob D is a good friend of ours. And he tells a beautiful story. But he's, he's gone to ashrams. He's sat at the feet of the Dalai Lama. He's done all this stuff. And he had a sponsor. He come to him one time and said, I want to start meditating. And the guy goes, and he didn't have time to mess with him. And he goes, why don't you just do what it says in the book? All right? The guy starts doing 86, 87, and 88 every morning right out of the book, following the clear-cut directions, exactly what it's telling him to do. He goes, in a few weeks, he was doing a lot better than I was, you know? <laughs> and it's that thing where you're going, hey, let me try that on myself, you know? I mean, you know, so there are clear-cut directions in here on the 11th step. Now, this thing about, you know, when Katie said the evening review is not, part of, if you if you chair a meeting on the evening review, I guarantee you half the room will go, I'm glad we're talking about the 10th step, you know, and it's clearly in 11, it's a 12 and 12 that money's lining up, it's just because at the bottom of 85, it says step 11 suggests prayer and meditation so we're in step 11, and you turn the page and it says when we retire at night, we constructively review our day, the interesting thing about this, uh Evening review is it's an exact reflection of how I've been doing in the tenth step. Remember, Katie said there's four things I'm watching for in the tenth step: selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. What there's four things I do about it. What are they? Talk to somebody else about it. Talk to God about it. I make amends if I need to, and I turn my attention to somebody I can help. And this is love and tolerance of others is our code. Well, now look at the evening review. We constructively review our day. Was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Aren't those the four things that we're supposed to have been watching for in Step 10? And remember the four things it said to do about it? Have I kept something to myself which should have been discussed with another person? Do I own an apology? Right, that was the set. Was I kind and loving towards all? Now, here's where I start bringing God into it. Because if it was the same as the 10th step, uh, why would we put it in there twice? But here it's saying, how'd you do in the, in the daily spot check inventory? At the end of the day, I just go, you know, what, did, I, did I let anything slip through my 10th step? And then it says, what could I have done better? Was I thinking of myself most of the time, or was I thinking what I could do for others? What I could pack into the stream of life? But I got to be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Why? Because that makes Charlie not feel good. No, because here's that selfish program crap again. It says, "For that would diminish my usefulness to others." Going into worry, remorse, morbid reflection, I'm not any good to anybody. 
You know, so we're looking at this stuff effectively and constructively, but I'm not going to go into my pity pot about what a turd I am because I'm not going to be usefulness to, to anybody under that way. After making up my review, I ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. So that's the evening review. Pretty clear-cut directions, wouldn't you say? It doesn't have to be at 11 o'clock when I'm getting ready to lay in the bed. It can be when I come home from evening. So I have a terribly hard time doing an evening review. I wanted to change it to the morning review for a while, you know, <laughs> because I always seem to do it the next morning. But it can be when I get home from, from work. It can be before I start watching TV. It can be after this. But, I mean, at some point I need to look at how did I do today if I'm trying to walk the spiritual path. Y'all with me on that? All right, so what do I do in the mornings? How much time I got? None? On awakening. On awakening. So let's see. When do I do this? Do I do this? On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. See if you hear any clear-cut directions in here. Okay, I wake up and I go, okay, let's think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. All right, what do I got going on today? Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. God, please direct my thinking. You know, you know, all right? Are, you, are we doing it so far? Especially asking that it be divorced from three things. Self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. I'm still laying in the bed, all right? This is upon awakening. Under these conditions, I can employ my mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. We could have a whole meeting on thought life. I don't know about you guys, but when I got here, I thought my thought life was the entire world. You know, if I thought it, it's reality. Because I'm hearing myself thinking it, and it sounds good, and it's true. And being able to sometimes step outside of my thought life and see, wow, look what happens when Charlie gets scared. Look what happens when Charlie feels shame. Look what happens when, you know. And, I mean, and so now I'm saying my thought life will be on a much higher plane when my thinking is cleared of wrong motives. That could be a whole topic in itself right there. In thinking about my day, I may face indecision. Right? We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought, or a decision. We relax and take it easy. It's implying to me that God is going to start giving me intuitive thought. That's a pretty huge promise. You know, this is not the same guy that rolled into page 24. This is, um, this is saying that, you know, if I, if I calm down, it's amazing how, how many times God will give me the right thought or action. I'm often surprised how the right answers have come after I've tried this for a while. Practice, practice, practice. Trying this thing over and over and over again. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. This is that vital sixth sense that the book talks about. And then it goes on to talk about it. You know, I may do some stupid stuff, but it says my thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. I start to rely upon it. And then it says, we usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer. But well, it's funny. We talked about that 1936 dictionary a little bit earlier. Because I always thought, you know, if you look up meditation in that dictionary, it says deep thought, thinking abstractedly, directed thinking. Because the, the, the definition of meditation changed in the 60s with the Eastern, a lot of Eastern religion influence and Ravi Shankar and, and you know, some of that stuff. I came to think that meditation meant sitting in the lotus position and doing alms and doing 30 minutes of, of quiet time. That, all, that stuff is awesome, along with what the book is saying to do. But the, what they're saying in the form of meditation <laughs> is this deep thought, this directed thinking of asking God to direct my thinking talking about, thinking about the day, asking that it be removed from this sort of thing. See what I'm saying? It's not necessarily, I do silent meditation. Katie does positive prayer and directed thought and a lot of Emmett Fox stuff, but along with what the book is saying. Does that make sense? Try these clear-cut directions. Try just getting up in the morning. If you haven't been doing anything, get up in the morning and try the upon awakening. Walk right through those definitions. Ask when it says ask. Pray when it says pray. 
you know, pause when it says pause and see how it goes for a while. It's it's am- it's amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. And then it says, um, talks about emphasize the principles we've discussed in their many helpful books. And then, and then there's a part of the eleventh step that gets skipped over a lot. You know, we hear a lot about pause. It says, as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful. Katie's the first one I ever heard say that pause is a promise. Pause is only available to me when I'm in the work. Right? If I'm blocked, if I'm if my head's running like the chatter of a thousand monkeys, I ain't pausing. It ain't coming. Does that make sense? But, it, but I used to think that it stopped with pause. I use a little acronym. Pause. It gives me four directions here. Pause when agitated or doubtful. Right? Tough work. But, you know, the other thing I notice is I know when I'm agitated, but I'm almost never doubtful. Yeah. Am I the only one? You know, there's a, there's a term... Uh, often wrong, but never in doubt, uh, mean anything to anybody. <laughs> you know, so I pause when agitated or doubtful. But then it, 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 you hear that a lot in meetings, but there's three more instructions after that. It says we ask for the right thought or action. We constantly, now it's going to restate the deal in step three again, as it does many times in the book, constantly reminding ourselves, that we're, so the word remind, reminding ourselves that we're no longer running the show, saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will, not mine, be done. I think, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, I think most of us would be lucky if we've ever said a couple of times each day, Thy will, not mine, be done. You know, my sponsees are striving for saying to ourselves several times each day, Thy will, not mine, be done. You know, because that's what it's telling me to do. It's taking me back to the deal in the third step. So there's a lot of work that can be done in this PARS thing. Pause, ask, remind, and say. We're then, then there's the eleven step promises. We're then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self pity, or foolish decisions. I become much more efficient. I don't tire so easily, for I'm not burning up energy foolishly as I did when I was trying to arrange life to suit myself. And I love this. It says it works. It really does. Turn to page sixty two. Remember why I'm going to quit playing God? It didn't work. Right? If it, if you weren't you're running the deal is working real good, rock on. But if you're running into the wall like I do when I'm on self, well, it says it doesn't work. And then back here it says this works. It really does. It says we alcoholics are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in a simple way we have just outlined. Give it a try. It's awesome stuff. Katie, did you want to say? We're going to take a break, and then Chris is going to talk about step 12. Um, Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.